Hola. Hey, what's going on? Man, nothing. Just another uh, another day, another dollar. <laughs> yeah, stacking that cheddar. <laughs> <laughs> nah, just same old, same old boring life. I don't know if I mentioned this last week. I feel like I did, but I realized I hate the question, uh, like, what's new? Did we talk about this? Uh, I don't think so. So, like... You know, like small talk, like people be like, so it's new. And I was like, nothing. And yeah, yeah. I used to like, I don't know, I kind of like that, but I hate that question now because like my life's pretty much really boring and I like it that way. But how do you say like, when I say like, oh, nothing's new, it just sounds like I'm trying to cut off the conversation. Yeah, right. That makes sense. There was a guy I met recently and I forget what he asked, but it was something similar to that. I was like, what do you do in your spare time or whatever um and you know it was not like uh what do you do for a living which everyone's like oh i i you know type on computers for a living um (laughs) you know like started a conversation um a lot easier i thought which is cool so we'll we'll have Mm. to do that (laughs) yeah the uh i also didn't mean to imply that i hated your question um the (laughs) there's like a little like duo of like bloggers called the minimalist and they in one of their books talk about they ask people like what are you passionate about instead of like what do you do but then i also feel weird asking that question because i don't know how to answer it you're like what would you die on a hill over (laughs) uh (laughs) (laughs) spec. oh man are you in in favor of spec? i'm in favor of testing i don't really I used, I don't know. I like, I kind of like had a pendulum swing for a while. Like, and I got started testing with RSpec. Mm-hmm. And then I like, I think swung. a lot of people do. Yeah. And then I like swung to the other side of like, give me all the things Rails uses by default. Uh-huh. And then like, I swung back to RSpec. So, like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I just kind of. We'll see you over here in the, uh, you know, <laughs> mini test side pretty soon. Pretty much. I mean, my thoughts on that are similar to my thoughts on like Hamill versus ERB, which is like the simpler, the better. So with like ERB, you're just using HTML that like a designer can work on or a front end developer, you know, can use with virtually no understanding of how ERB works or Ruby. So on one hand, like that's really great. You have to type a little longer and write closing tags and whatever. But when it comes to like, you know, for, for Hamill, if you have to do anything sort of complicated where you need, you know, a lot of data attributes or JavaScript in a script tag or something like that, it gets messy pretty quick and you Mm -hmm. have to try and find examples for that. And it takes, it takes a while for you to like figure out what the heck this is. And then like, you don't have closing tags, but it's also really easy to make a mistake and have an extra tab or not. And I see a lot yeah. of people, you know, they don't have their, the developer doesn't have their editor set up to tabs versus spaces or two space tabs or whatever. And then all of a sudden your HTML is all screwed up because, you know, the editor was not set up perfectly. And so, you know, there's a lot of those things where I'm like, for a little less typing that my editor already auto completes the end tags. Like I, it feels like it just introduces a different set of problems and doesn't really save time at the end of the day. So uh, for our spec, I feel somewhat the same way. I mean, there's different philosophy in it, but there's when you pull out like shared examples and then you say like this object should uh, behave like X And then you have to go find the shared example and figure out how it works to figure out why your test is failing. It just adds sort of this like, I don't know, level of indirection that is frustrating because when you're writing tests, they're already hard enough to get right to make sure you're testing the right thing that I don't mind duplication in my tests uh, in a lot of cases because it makes it so that the test is kind of like that's everything in this test is exactly what is running. And if there's something wrong, it's, you know, in one of these lines right here. And I don't have to jump around to 
15 different let statements at the top of my RSpec file or in the middle because there's like nested context blocks and that sort of thing. So I've always leaned towards like the simpler version of that, just where it's more straightforward. Yeah. And just like, I don't know. uh, It it seems because when I'm writing tests, I'm, I'm not concerned about duplication very much. Like I might be in my code. So when I'm testing, I don't really care about any duplication. So I don't know. It's kind of the, that, that thought has evolved over the years as I've like done more of this, but I will, I will say that when I came back from team mini test, of course, I, like I said, <clears throat> I don't hate mini tests, but that's one thing about our spec. I tried to like set rules for myself. So I won't go any deeper than like one describe and one context. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I try not to actually set up the world at the top, like with a bunch of lets and things, I try to do it like a per test basis. Yeah. Now, like yeah. if I notice that every single test uses the same setup, like it's a little different, but right. Yeah. But not, I, you know, not extracting out to a let for one test just because you might yeah. use it in the future, which, which is what you tend to see with people who are like, Oh, our spec has all of these features and they just start to use as many features as they can. And it's kind of the opposite of what you want to do in testing. Like you really want your test to be as coherent as possible and, you know, not spread out. It's just trying to test one thing and it needs to be very clear about that because there's just, there's so many things that can go wrong. I had some tests the other day that I, I had written, I don't remember, like a month ago or something. I thought it was testing exactly what I wanted. It was really concise. And then <laughs> I noticed it's actually not in, you know, asserting the correct thing. And so I was awesome. like, oh crap, you know, but it like, it passed and everything made sense when I was writing it. And then looking back later, I'm like, it actually didn't, it missed this tiny piece. And, uh, you know, so it was not really a valid or a good test and I cleaned it up, but it was like that just pointed out how subtle your test can be to assert you know, the wrong thing that like, okay, we submit this controller action. It returned to success. We must be good. Well, maybe not. Like, did it, you know, create the record in your database? Did it assign the values correctly and all that stuff? You know, it, it's pretty nuanced when it comes to writing complicated tests. So it's also really easy to find, like I've noticed I'll find myself sometimes writing tests that, get so like stubbed and mocked, they actually don't test anything. Mm-hmm. Like I'm exerting I'm asserting that this thing I set up does nothing. Yeah. Uh, it, it like returns the value that I set up and it's like You're like, just making sure your mock worked and it's like, well, <laughs> you know, that's not that useful, right? <laughs> yeah, I have to be really careful of that. Yeah. <laughs> that's a very easy thing to do. And I've been doing a ton of testing videos on Go Rails lately and um, you know, that is one of the things that I'm going to talk about, you know, with mocks and stubs and they come in really handy sometimes. Like we've talked about in the past, like all of our Stripe integration with Stripe Ruby mock is, I mean, that all comes from your, your mocks being like very hard to get right sometimes. Cause we can integrate with this fake Stripe API, but like we actually need the real one to be confident that production works. So, yeah, you have to be pretty careful about mocking things because it's not real, you know? Mm, yeah. They are, they're super handy, but they're also super easy to abuse. Yeah. Some, some of it's just simple. Like they come in extremely good handy uh, situations. Like when you're like, oh, look, I just want to make sure you called this method on mm-hmm. this class. And you're like, all right, we'll stub that out and we're done. And you can be pretty confident that that did what it needed to do, but like you didn't have to call that external API or something. So there are situations like that that are really good because maybe you don't want to run VCR and web mock <laughs> to record the actual API. Um, but there are also often many good times where you want to do that too. So yeah. yeah, it's also, they're handy for like, 
Uh, so I, I use the interactor pattern a lot, the interactor gym. And so like, I'll have an interactor that calls another one. And like, I don't really want that other one to fire. Like I already yeah. know. You just like, want to know it got called or it should get right. called. You don't really need to run it in your test. Yeah. And cause like, I may have to set up more of the world for that. And like, mm. I'm not really interested in that. Like I've already tested that somewhere else. Yeah, exactly. But, Where you're like, you know, building a user registration and you're like, well, I want to send them over to convert kit or something, but I don't actually need to do that in my test suite. Right. I just want to know that it was called and assume that that works. Yeah. Yeah. One other thing I want to circle back to you. So I actually, I used some shared examples uh, in something I was working on the other day for like one of my side projects. And I feel like it's actually kind of a cool case. So I wanted to test that like in my controller actions that you literally can't do anything if you're not signed in, like you get redirected, Mm -hmm. you know, the login. So I made shared examples for like, it's called like an unauthorized user, like unauthenticated user. And then I built this action class and it just, it's actually not a class. It's a struct and it takes the HTTP method and then the actual method name. So like, Git is a colon or a symbol mm-hmm. and then index is a symbol and you just pass an array of those actions to the shared examples and it just asserts that like you get redirected. That's cool. Yeah. And that's a good situation because I mean, the alternative could be to write like a, a test with a loop that like goes through all of those, but it's probably a bit more clear. And that's one of those cases where like it is handy to have that, but you can also, um, you can kind of build your own, like our spec comes with shared examples, but like you could build your own helper method to go do that for you as many tests. Like the rails test suite does some of that stuff with, um, the generators tests, I think, cause those generators like call rails new and then expect it to like, or, or scaffold generate or whatever, and expect it to create files. And then they have to go clean those up too. So they have some, um, things like that that I've seen that you know work really well and it's just kind of the same thing like you're uh, calling this uh, generic thing that you made and so I think that's another piece to point out is that your test suite those classes are also just regular Ruby classes and they happen to be a test suite but you can make your own helper methods you can add more classes you know you can make a a class user in there that doesn't inherit from active record that you can just throw around as a fake user or something. And, you know, your tests can run against that and they don't have to run against like real, uh, you know, rails code or something. So how is, uh, the testing series going? Good. Um, we've mostly just kind of done more introductory stuff for now. Um, I'm going to dive into some more complicated things. I just published a video today because yesterday I set up uh, GitHub Actions to run a CI um, for a Rails app. So it goes and sets up, you know, your Postgres and your Redis Docker containers and then your Ruby environment and installs libpq dev so you can compile the PG gem and stuff. And I just published a video on that. So it was pretty good, and we'll get into more of that, you know, VCR and web mock, web mock pretty soon. Um, did a little bit on system testing, and, you know, it's just kind of the higher level stuff right now, but I'd like to dive into some examples that are, like, specific. Um, we'll di- we're doing all mini tests for now, but we'll dive into our spec and probably do a comparison video, too, at some point. Like a 60 second video, just like a bunch of you cussing. <laughs> um, yeah, it'll be like, oh, look how easy it is in mini tests. And it's like <laughs> 45 minutes of, hmm, how do we, what's, what's wrong with this R spec stuff? <laughs> 45 minutes might be one of your longer go <laughs> videos. Yeah, probably would be. Um, the whole deploy guide was like 40 minutes, if I remember right. That was a long one, but that's, mm-hmm. There's a lot of stuff anyways, but yeah. Um, 
I'm just kidding about our spec. Like it is great. And it is one of the better things, you know, one of the interesting things about our spec is like, it reads really well. So if you're new to rails and you're like, I want to make sure that you have validations on this, you have like a validations, um, you know, helper to test that. And there's a lot of, you know, niceties about that, but as things get more complicated, it can also kind of get in your way where you can use some of that stuff in, in a way that ends up being hard to maintain or something. So uh, you just have to be aware of that and try and shoot for simplicity. And And I think that's not necessarily like, I think it's that sort of, if you're a beginner developer, you want to do complicated things. And so you try and do complicated stuff, but the more that you are, experience the less complicated stuff you want to want to build so it's kind of funny you know i think that tends to happen with a lot of test suites have you um have you done cucumber before yes i did a mountain of cucumber at my last job yeah uh, how, how was the experience uh so it was inherited code base and when I got it, it already took like an hour to run. <laughs> um, and it was I'm trying to use my words carefully. <laughs> Cucumber itself isn't necessarily a bad tool. Um, there's a lot of indirection, like you're talking about earlier, mm-hmm. that comes from using a tool like Cucumber because, like, you write these like English sentences. And then you go back and like define scenarios that are like methods that take either like regular expressions or that exact sentence. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of times like there's methods defined in there that you don't know where they're defined because they're just like this global namespace. And then uh, like scenarios can call other scenarios. Like it's not... Like if a scenario uses a regex, it's not super easy to find when there's a hundred files of cucumber tests, right? So like right. <laughs> you have to like kind of like do fuzzy searches for like one or two words, and uh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, because if, if you haven't used it before, like you can say um, blank is signed in, and you could pass in user or admin or member or whatever. And then you could write like a regex that says, you know, give us the type and we'll go log in whatever kind of user you asked for. So you can make it generic with these arguments, but because they're like regexes, they're kind of hard to search for. And I had a similar experience with that where we inherited, I inherited a cucumber test suite and an RSpec test suite from some guys that were like previously just out of uh, boot camp, and yeah, I mean, it was there. The one of the things was like all of the cucumber tests that required to be signed in started with visit the login page, type in the email and password, then log in, then visit the URL we want to test, and then do stuff. And I was like, well, if we just simply cheat and log you in with a cookie with the device helper, we just save like 10 minutes of our test suite because we're doing that redundantly over and over and over again. It was ridiculous. Mm. So, yeah. And we had stuff like you were saying with like um, someone would write a test like when user is logged in and then someone else would write a test like when user is signed in. And we'd have separate definitions that did the same thing or whatever that were like hard to catch because they were defined in whoever, who knows what file they decided to put it in. Yeah. It tough. And it made it tough because like I went through a phase where I wanted to like optimize it, but like it was so spread out. And like I only added to that. And I, I'm not so sure that like if I would have written all that, I wouldn't have ended up with the same like yeah. sprawled out code. It just, yeah. it was difficult and it made me just want to use like our spec or mm-hmm. now mini test system tests yeah. like that's what we did we just pulled out i i gave up on the cucumber stuff because no one was except for me was writing these bdd scripts 
or whatever. And I was like, well, why do we even have these if I can just write it as a R spec test? Because we did have a bunch of R spec stuff. So I just pulled those out and had them run Chrome instead. And it was like a million times easier to wrap your head around. And I mean, at some point I was like, look, these are a lot of overhead and they're not adding that much value for us to like test that we can get the index page. Like if we ever break that, like we will notice it right away. And so I'm willing to delete that cucumber test to save, you know, 30 seconds of our test suite and, you know, re-implement that in a controller test or something. And, you know, so just kind of changing that made a huge difference. Yeah. The other thing about it was that, uh, like none of the stakeholders, if you will, were like running those tests. So it was literally like, it was just us. So like, kind of like you said, like, why wouldn't we yeah. at that point just write tests that we normally run? Yeah. Cause the whole point of that is like, you have non-developers creating your test suite or like the, the cases you're trying to run. Cause they, they're defining them in the, you know, when this situation happens, expect this result and they just write it like a story which is good if you have non-technical people creating those and monitoring them and stuff we didn't have that we only had one developer anyway so it was just like why are we doing any of this work and it's a lot of it's a lot of boilerplate because you've got to go write your test then go match and create those matching regexes then write your one line which is another thing it was like all the uh, the work and setup that you had to do was like these one liners spread out all over the place that could easily get inconsistent or you just couldn't wrap your head around what exactly was happening. It was strange. The other thing that was difficult was the test suite was all or the cucumber tests were all tied to CSS classes. And one of my responsibilities while I was there was we redesigned our storefront. And so about 70% of those tests just broke. (laughs) And so, yeah, I had to go back in. Uh, What I ended up doing, one of my friends recommended I write data attributes that are just for like solely exist for like, testing cucumber and so that's what i did so hopefully if they ever change it again they can rely on those but who knows yeah hmm. yeah it's uh it's an interesting experience it definitely feels like sharp tools that if you don't know what you're doing you can really cause some damage <laughs> so just like everything else though, i always wonder do i just not know how to use it like yeah but that's you know it's like uh how it you give someone a sharp knife and you haven't told them that it's sharp, like, you know, things are not going to go well. Um, but you know, it's, it, it's something you have to just take a lot of time and practice. Um, and I haven't gone back and used cucumber cause I really have a need for it. And, you know, I'd rather spend my time writing R spec or mini test and, and getting good at that. Mm. I've been, trying to practice more tdd which is not my mo at all Mm -hmm. how's Uh, it going it's going well i'm not i'm not like strict on it um but i've been trying it on like a pretty big project at work and it has helped somewhat shape the direction of code Uh, i feel like some things are less coupled and i'm thinking a few steps ahead Uh, not necessarily like over optimizing but just thinking clear about the next steps and that's been good um but i don't do know you, I, do you I, typically have pretty like concise or like well written um uh, like requirements for what you're doing before you start we have screens and so like mock-ups or whatever yeah and usually like this project I'm working on very big projects. Like we did some like exploratory stuff in terms of like tech. Um, but then I pretty much just made the requirements and 
a lot of times like the technical requirements change as you go because like you didn't think about something or mm-hmm. uh, like your assumption was wrong. And I found that like since I've been doing TDD, like my other style is write everything and then go back and test it. And yeah, then a, yeah. I don't want I don't want to test it and B, I I see all these like rough patches that could have been avoided. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting thing um, to because you you will have a tendency to either do all your testing up front or none of it, and then do it all afterwards, and that's definitely like natural. I feel like because I had a project I was working on um, recently that was doing a lot of calendar stuff, and there's just you know tons and tons of complexity around that. And we had originally started where I was doing tons of testing around all that, making sure it was working and time zones and, you know, what, whatever other exceptions and things came down the pipeline. It, it began to be a thing where it was like, well, you know, we also haven't, it was for a startup too. So, so there was a lot of situations where it's like, well, we may need to re-architect all of this soon or whatever. And we ended up getting into a position of like, we'll just wait and we'll go build out our ideas and see what we think and see how it works. And if it's not working, we'll go, you know, rewrite it or we discover some unexpected, you know, requirement. And, um, we ended up just kind of, you know, we don't know what we're doing yet. So let's hold off on writing tests because that's just a lot of work we're going to have to go throw away. And it slows us down from prototyping what we're trying to figure out. Like, we don't really know how this needs to work just yet. So writing too many tests early on is just going to cause us to be a lot slower. And it felt strange to do that, to go from something that was like really robustly tested and strong to this thing that was like, well, it's getting a little creaky now because we don't really know where we're headed. And you know, that was an interesting um, thing, but it, that I think happens a lot when you're like, you know, on a new product or something that you're like, well, we're not really sure what features we need or what people are going to ask for versus more probably where you were at, which is we've got an existing product and have had it for years and, you know, we're, we're changing how it works, but we have a much stronger requirement of stability. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I, I found I've been trying to apply it to like one of my side projects too. And I'm finding what I do there is I just try to work in smaller increments. So like I'll maybe like write a couple of functions and then be like, okay, stop, go test it. Um, but for all of these, like even if requirements change, I'm finding that the tests are easier to change. Um, I mean, it's not always just sunshine, but it's not as bad as you would think. And so that's been nice. I don't know. Feels like uh, feels like I'm living right. <laughs> I one time yeah. put on Twitter like and asked, "How do you make testing not feel like a chore?" And a lot of people said TDD and a year later, I was like, oh, maybe I'll try it. So, Yeah, it's good. Um, you know, I think there's there's a lot of value in that. And, you know, like especially if you don't do that, as long as you have, you know, CI set up and are regularly adding tests for things, like you can practice and get to that point. Like it requires quite a bit of, just testing is a weird thing. Like it's not like coding where you're like, trying to make something work. It's a whole different kind of process where you have to confirm that something worked. It's like a discipline. Yeah. And it definitely is a discipline because you can easily be like, well, you know, we tested it in the browser locally and it worked, but it doesn't work in production or whatever. And it's like, well, you know, you want to make sure that your development environment's as close to production as you can. And, you know, all those things are about not being sloppy like those little things we talked about like uh spaces versus tabs in your editor like it's best if you can have i don't know a linter or something if you have a lot of team members and they're not being consistent 
and you want to make sure that you enforce that stuff and, you know, encourage people in the process to be consistent. The Rails uh, Test Prescriptions book by Noel Raffin uh, starts, like the first chapter is like a story of two developers and one of them writes test like as they go along and the other one just does like manual testing and it talks about how the one who does manual testing like gets the feature out the door quicker um but then like they talk about like adding more requirements and adding more requirements and how the person who's like already automated those tests starts to move quicker because they don't like if they automated like system test uh, or not automated they they automated like the manual process with system tests. It's a lot easier just to run those than to like manually open and test it all. It's really, I don't know, it was mm-hmm. a really good selling point on. Yeah, tests first. definitely. I mean, I think that's the big thing. Like the longer that you work on a project, the more that you're going to need tests. Like there's so many, and I think that's probably part of the reason why like testing is hard to learn because most people are learning to test and they don't, they don't have a project that they're working on that has thousands of users that mm-hmm. expect it to work every day. And right. so if you don't have that like requirement, you're not going to understand the value of it near as much. And you're not going to be able to practice it as well too, because like you won't know when something broke or you wrote a test that didn't actually test what you thought it did, you know? So I wonder if there's a good way of teaching that, like having something that, I don't know. It's you have to have something people use and will report bugs on, but or or maybe it's just you build some fake site that has like a bot that will like email you that's like, hey, this is broken. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Something like that would be interesting. Just to 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 build some sort of fake production thing for people to learn that on, and you give them like, okay, here's here's some new requirements go, you know, fix this, but you're going to have to break stuff to, to, you know, add this feature or whatever. I think that would be cool. While we're talking testing, uh, since that is clearly now today's topic of conversation, uh, I also started JavaScript testing. Okay. What are you using uh, for, for that? Uh, so I'm writing React right now. So using Jest and Enzyme. So Jest is like your assertions, your expectations. Mm -hmm. And then Enzyme is like a library by Airbnb, which is made for testing React components. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so... So do you you run those like as a a node command or something? Yeah, so... And uh, does that live in your Rails repository or do you have a separate... So uh, since we're using Webpacker... Uh, it integrates pretty nice, and so in my package JSON, I have a actually yeah, so I have a yarn test command, and that runs the test, and then I just like I put the test in our spec directory, just like where our spec test lives. So it's like spec JavaScript uh, to try and match because like the spec directory kind of like one for one is a match with the app directory. And so I thought we have app JavaScript. Why not make it spec JavaScript? And the folder structure lines up with the folder structure in app, like app JavaScript components, whatever. But yeah. So it's, do you do you add that step as a separate, you know, run tests in your CI or yeah, I've made our CI quite difficult. Um because I parallelized it. Is that a word? Mm-hmm. Uh Using the oh, app stack oh, and Heroku. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> uh, and so we have like right now we run 16 Heroku dinos in our test split across that. Oh cool. And I had yeah, it's awesome. It took our test suite time down by like, I don't know, 16. Uh and the problem though is like I don't know how to reliably get JavaScript testing, like Knapsack will do JavaScript. So like you can split your yarn test or whatever, but 
I don't know how to get it to work also with it doing that for Ruby. So like yarn tests runs like JavaScript tests, as you might be surprised, run pretty quick. Uh, so what I ended up doing was we run Pronto on Circle CI, and Pronto runs like our RuboCop just to make sure like it's our linter, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to run yarn test right now. And yarn test takes 2.583 seconds right now to run. So I just threw it on Circle because you can run multiple workflows on Circle CI. Yeah, nice. That's fast. Yeah. So like Pronto and Yarn, Pronto and Jest run on Circle, and then our Ruby run on Heroku. And if we didn't already have Circle CI set up, I might reconsider. But I was like, what's another? What's another workflow when it's already mm-hmm. set up? Yeah, and you know, th- this brings up a good point of like, you know, that you're you, if you have a slow test suite, you're going to be very discouraged from adding any more tests or dealing with the tests. Period. You're just going to want to avoid them. So it's like you know, one of these things is crucial is just to to make sure you write fast, you know, consistent tests when they're when the, that's the big thing too is you know if you have a test that randomly fails go figure it out as soon as you can because you know that's if you leave that there and you're like oh we just rerun the test we if it fails and then usually it passes like right. you don't want that it is just you don't any have of these things that it actually passed yeah you don't know for sure if it's actually working or you know any of that and then it just degrades your trust in your test suite, which is like the whole reason you have a test suite. So, yeah, we we have some odd like six thousand specs, and so the easiest win for us was to just run them in parallel on Heroku because it's not that much more expensive for the amount like. Yeah, you, you think if you run sixteen dynos in much less of the time, you run one, the pricing comes out the same. And we even right. like bumped it up to like I think performance L, so like the, one of the faster Heroku uh-huh. dynos. So it's yeah, uh, you're you're gonna pay a little more for what a minute, two minutes, you know? Like, right. It's not a big deal because. Because of the beauty of, you know, cloud hosting now, you have the ability to pay by the second, the minute, whatever. That makes it so that like, okay, we'll throw this really expensive server at it for a couple of minutes. That's fine. Like still only going to cost us a dollar or something. So yeah, it's, it's been really nice. And like our builds take a hot minute, like going for building on staging and then deploying to production. So it's nice that like we could reduce like, some time with testing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because at the end of the day, the expensive part is your developer's time. So spending a few extra bucks to make your test suite faster or whatever it is, it's worth it, you know? Yeah, it all kind of, I think like part of it was kind of selfish because I got my iMac Pro and I could run tests in parallel or like I worked on running tests in parallel on my computer because it could use all eight cores. And so then I was like, well, I want this in CI. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. And it's good for everybody too. You can, you know, make a PR review it faster because you have to wait less time for the test to pass. And it just is good in general. Speaking of circle the other day, I pushed in both Jest and Pronto failed. And I was like, well, that's odd. And then I noticed Circle CI status was like degraded performance. And I was like, oh, okay. And then I got on Hacker News and it was like Docker hub is down or whatever it is, the <laughs> Docker host. And I was like, well, that is why Circle won't build because it pulls from Docker. So, yeah, man, that's dealing with uh, setting up GitHub Actions and Circle recently. Like, Oh man, there's so much, it takes so many iterations to like, okay, we'll copy paste this template for our test suite and hopefully this will work. And then like, no, it broke here. And then you rerun it again with your changes. Like, okay, it broke on the next step now. Now we got this other error and you have like 
yesterday I had like 30 commits in a row that were like fixed GitHub actions, <laughs> you know, because it was like, oh, miss this environment variable or this setting was wrong or whatever. And it it's funny, but it's really bad with um, GitHub actions right now because they have no caching, which I forgot how useful that was on CircleCI yeah. where like you bundle install and it saves those gems when you bundle install it on GitHub Actions, it starts fresh every time. And oh, re- it recompiles. Yeah, recompiling Nokogiri and the SAS uh, C extension, all that stuff takes forever. So for my tiny test suite, it would take like seven or eight minutes to run because of the you know dependencies installing and all of that every single time. And yeah, so I was reading up on it and like, they're like, there's a thread in GitHub's community site that's like, we need caching for GitHub Actions. And they're like, hmm, can you explain your use case? And they're like, how about <laughs> how about doing anything? <laughs> and they're like, okay, we see your point. Like, we'll have this out by mid-November. So that's good. About a month away or so. Um, and I guess they'll have that, which will be a, that'll make it a whole heck of a lot better. But it's, you know, completely free right now, which is great. And there's, you know, your GitHub CI and stuff. So I, I was kind of going through all these because I want to have that included as options out of the box for Jumpstart Pro. So, like, I don't really care where you want to run your CI, but, you know, you have your Circle CI, your GitHub Actions, your GitLab CI configs ready to go for it. And you can just, like, choose which one you want to use. And you're you're now integrating with now you're integrating continuously. <laughs> so well, well, yeah. I guess it's about that time. Uh, we better get back to work, huh? Yeah, that's that's what we should do. <laughs> yeah, I've got got some. Well, we've been um, working on adding some integrations to. Amazon RDS and Elasticash and the DigitalOcean managed databases for Hatchbox. So um, I'm going to hop back on that and we're going to get that set up so you can, you know, used to be you go create them yourself and copy and paste the database URL into Hatchbox, but we're going to set it up so we can go ahead and create those for you inside the app and save you some time. So I think that's that's what we're going to fix up. I was using Hatchbox the other day and I looked at like digital oceans managed database. It's like 20 bucks. It's like, nah. Yeah. We were looking at, um, Aurora and, and, uh, RDS is like production options. Boy, those get expensive real fast. <laughs> They're like, you know, $200 for the minimum tier or something on mm. RDS production. It was like, well, you know, I get it for, true production for most people or most most businesses like you need failover and all of that so you know that's not going to be cheap but yeah for for testing i was like well we're gonna stick with that free tier huh (laughs) it's pretty cool though if you're like on rds then you can just deploy your app to hatchbox and point the url there probably with yeah downtime Yep, no, it's it's really nice. Um, same thing with DigitalOcean databases and whatever. Well, at some point, we'll probably also integrate with their uh, load balancers that they offer, um, which would be cool too. But it makes it a little tougher because we can't really do your SSL for you, I think, for those because that has to go through their load balancer. So um just ends up being more complex. Like every day I work on this and like, now I know why Heroku controls all the servers for you because <laughs> this saves a whole heck of a lot of trouble trying to manage people's, you know, DO or AWS accounts. It is, sure. it is quite a lot of work, but yeah, uh, it's been fun to, to work on. And it's one of those that I'm like, man, I wish I had a better, approach to testing that stuff because well you know how how do you how do you reliably test that your rails app ssh is into creates a server then ssh is into it and runs a bunch of bash scripts 
and it does all of that correctly. Like that is not an easy, easy thing to test because it's so much code running on some third party server and you don't want to have to run your test that wait five minutes for a server to get configured or something like, I don't know how to test that yet. So if anybody has ideas, definitely send me them in, on Twitter or something. <laughs> Very cool. Well, we'll see you next week. Cool. See you, man.